is also known as dn over dt, or dn dt, which is equal to the birth rate times the population size minus the death rate times the population size. To abbreviate this even further, if we take this term of uh, birth rate times population size minus death rate times population size, which is kind of a mouthful, that can be abbreviated to little r. And little r is going to stand for our instantaneous growth rate. Okay, so at any given time, at an uh, infinitesimally small slice of that time, uh, the instantaneous growth rate is going to be equal to b times n minus d times n. We abbreviate that as little r. How am I doing so far explaining this? Good? Okay. So that means that we can take this equation and simplify it even further to say that the instantaneous growth rate times the population size will give us the change in population uh, over time. So that's all that this equation is saying. This is our exponential model for population growth which means that uh, we can also look at this using this equation, where once again, if we know the population size at time zero, what are we starting with? And we multiply that by uh, this exponential equation, e to the rt, then we can predict with pretty good confidence, if we think the population is growing exponentially, what the population size will be at any given time that we want. Any questions about this? Now, maybe you've seen something like this if you took a finance class or economics or something like that. This is the same equation that we use to calculate compound interest, which is why it's really important to save money because you're having exponential growth. Uh, these populations that grow exponentially behave similarly to your bank account could. Uh, in terms of increasing exponentially. How does this look graphically? Uh, let's compare the geometric growth that we talked about earlier, where we have periodic readers, compared to exponential growth with continuous readers, with the same population uh, uh, reproductive rate. So we have big R for our net reproductive rate for our periodic readers of 0.2, and we have little r, which is our instantaneous growth rate for our continuous readers of 0.2, You'll notice that they have similar J-shaped patterns for both of them. But at the same time point, there's going to be more population or more individuals in that population, I should say, for the exponential growth versus the geometric growth. Does that make sense? So I wanted to pause for a second and highlight a fun tool that you have. So I've got this linked on the Canvas page if you want to play along at home. Um, this is an app that allows you to simulate what we're talking about today. And you can play around with these numbers and look at population growth and how it would change with various aspects. Right? So um, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but what we're talking about here is what's known as density independent growth. Exponential growth is another word for it. And what this app allows you to do is you can manipulate our model and plug in different numbers for our intrinsic growth rate, which is the same as saying the instantaneous growth rate. And we can also change around our initial population size. Uh, we won't do this today. You could add a second species. We'll think about that more uh, later. But let's, um, let's just take a look at this. So we can change the length of the simulation. So this is 100 generations. Our instantaneous growth rate is 0.24. We're looking at density independent growth. So our model in this case is dn dt equals r times n, right? 
So here's what that looks like, right? So we basically go along and we're starting with 50 individuals. You can see that it takes a while to ramp up, but by generation 75, you get that characteristic uh, J-shaped curve. So it takes a little while, but, but there we are. We're increasing quite rapidly um, uh, by generation 75 or so. So let's see what happens if we change our initial population size. Let's bump it up to 1,000. And so I don't think that changes too much in terms of the shape, but it does change the scale on our y-axis quite a bit. So here we're looking at, what is this, 3 trillion. If we start at 1,000, it's more like 2 times 10 to the 10th individuals by generation 60. Okay, so changing the initial population size doesn't change the overall relationship too much, but it does expand our scale to be quite high um, uh, later on. Let's start with just 11 individuals and let's reduce our intrinsic growth rate as low as we can go. <clears throat> Anyone else jumped on there? Is it working for you? No. Nope. We must have crashed it. Oh. It is now. Oh well. Oh, oh. fine. Okay. So I'm going to bump this down. So you can see when we slow down an intrinsic growth rate to 0.03, we're not increasing nearly as fast. That increase starts happening, it looks more like a J earlier, perhaps, but that's partially just because of the scale that we're looking at here, right? Um, so we're not going all the way out to 1 trillion individuals, we're only going to 400. So you can see that a bit better. The other thing I want to show you is you can look at these different relationships between, this is log population size. So if we take the natural log of our population, that straightens out the line so we can see that the population is increasing um, that way. You can also look at population growth rate, DNDT, uh, as a relationship with population size. You can see that that's also increasing. And then you can look at the uh, per capita growth rate, which is dn over n times dt, and you can see that per capita growth rate is constant, right? It's not changing through time. All right, that's enough for that. So hopefully that's helpful to play around with and think about this idea that all else being equal, population size of uh, exponentially growing species is going to increase faster than periodic breeders. Both of them will have this J-shaped curve uh, as long as intrinsic rate of growth or uh, uh, net reproductive rate is greater than one. So let's uh, Keep them in the back of our mind that we can see geometric and exponential growth in nature. It does occur. 
but what are some things that are unrealistic about it? Why might it not be observed? And what might cause it to follow a different trajectory or different path and pattern that we would need to model in a different way? So if you looked ahead, then you might have seen or thought about a big aspect of what we see in nature is that the amount of resources that are available to a population are not necessarily going to be unlimited forever. So resources could be broadly defined. It doesn't have to be just like food or water or things of that nature. Space is another great example of a resource that uh, you know, we have limited uh, uh, resources in that regard. At some point, we expect there to be so many individuals that they're going to exhaust the resources that are available to them. And then that could have a limiting effect or a constraint on their population growth. So what does that look like? Uh, and then additionally, what are the effects of other populations, right? So right now we're just considering population growth for one species. What if we added another species into the mix? What would that look like? We'll talk more about that um, uh, in the next couple lectures. What about okay. natural phenomena? Mm -hmm. What about like natural phenomena of earthquakes? Yes, we'll talk about that as well. That is less density dependent. That's what's called density independent. So yeah. Um, so what are the limits of growth and their effect on population size? This is the model that we're talking about here is known as logistic growth. And uh, like I said, we could visualize this in many different ways. One way that I like to visualize it is by looking at space and thinking about individuals and their competition for space as a resource and how quickly if you have exponential growth if you're going from two individuals, by the ninth generation, if they're taking up <coughs> as much space as indicated by these little circles here, by the ge ninth generation, they're completely overlapping and would likely be competing for space uh, more so than they are in generation one. So what's going to happen to population growth if they're competing for space? It's something that they need to reproduce uh, and they're pairing on top of each other. What does that mean for their population growth? Well, what we might expect is the population to start to flatten out, right? So as the rate of growth of a population slows down, that curve is going to start looking like a J and look more like an S, right? So the factors that we're thinking about here are what going, are going to determine exactly where that flattening out happens. And the way that we talk about that location in our graph is known as the carrying capacity, K. By definition, if we're below the carrying capacity, or K, then there's enough resources for all the individuals in that population. If you're above the carrying capacity, for, uh, whatever resource you're thinking about, whether it's food, water, or space, uh, if, there's, if you're above that threshold, then there's not enough resources, and you expect population growth to slow down. What's actually the kind of mechanism behind that is that death rate is going to start outweighing birth rate in our equation, right? So if you remember birth times population size minus death times population size, if death rate is greater than birth rate, then that means our instantaneous rate of growth would be negative and we would see population start to decline. So here's what that looks like graphically. Here's our exponential model, dn dt equals r times n. That's our J-shaped curve. Logistic growth is indicated by this model here, which takes our exponential growth, R times N, and then adds a second term that considers our carrying capacity. Notice that the carrying capacity is also going to be linked with population size in this way. Okay? So let's talk through exactly what happens when the population n reaches or approaches that carrying capacity k and what that does to this mathematical equation. Again, we can see this in nature. Uh, if you remember, we talked about with population ecology the first day and some of the history behind it. These data that, we sh that I showed you from uh, Gauza, 
looking at paramecium or single cell organisms grown in a beaker through time showed very clearly this kind of S-shaped curve, this logistic growth, indicating that um, uh, after about 10 days, there weren't enough resources to support, to support more population growth of this single cell organism. Interestingly, if we look at this population of Daphnia, the uh, zooplankton, again grown in kind of a lab setting, in this case you can see population increased quite a bit and then actually decreased and then it's kind of stabilized after that. So this would be called population overshoot. This is where the population size exceeded the carrying capacity and then there was a correction back down towards that carrying capacity in terms of the numbers that was facilitated by basically increased death rates and, and therefore decreased population size. Right, so does everyone see that, those two patterns here? Okay. So, both of these graphs illustrate some interesting aspects of this equation, or this model, that demonstrate what happens when population size is small relative to K or when it is large relative to K, or the carrying capacity. All right, so let's take an example and plug in some numbers here. So here's our, our model, where we're taking our exponential growth, or multiplying it by this term, which is our carrying capacity. If we take our instantaneous growth rate, let's say it's 0.1, and our population size is 100 in this case, and our carrying capacity is 1,000, if we do the math here, 1,000 minus 100 divided by 1,000, is that a big number or a small number? This would be 9 out of 10, right? Mm -hmm. So if we multiply that, we'd expect population size to increase quite rapidly, right? So we're going to add 9 individuals in this case. Um, what happens if we're halfway to our benchmark, our criteria of carrying capacity of 1,000? Population size is still going to be increasing, and it's going to be increasing the fastest out of the entire uh, pattern here. Right? So if we're halfway to the carrying capacity, that is where population increase is going to be most rapid. And then when we approach carrying capacity, so now we've got a uh, population size of 900, remember our carrying capacity is 1,000. 1,000 minus 900 would be 100 over 1,000, which would be basically uh, one-tenth. That means that our population is now growing by nine individuals again. So what this means is that population size is going to increase most rapidly in between our carrying capacity and our initial population size. And it's going to be much slower as we approach that carrying capacity. Okay, so this, this is the model that allows us to illustrate this pattern mathematically. All right. So I'm going to ask you this rhetorically. Think about it. Where on the S-shaped curve, just ballpark, would you expect population size to be increasing the fastest? I'll give you three options. Here, in the middle, or up here. If you're thinking in the middle, good. Okay. So what we've been talking about with this logistic growth, or the S-shaped curve, is what's known as density-dependent growth. And that means that the density of individuals within a population is what's driving the population growth rate. Okay, so their, their, their density relative to the carrying capacity is what's going to dictate the actual population growth that we expect to observe. And it's all about competition for resources um, uh, as, as one example of density dependence. So in crowded populations, for example, 
increasing density is going to intensify competition for scarce resources uh, that results in lower birth rate or higher death rate. Okay. So the example I'm giving here is a monoculture of some kind of crop plant. Uh, all these plants are competing for the same set of resources, the same nitrogen, the same soil, the same light, uh, the same amount of water. When they are more densely packed in to an area, then that amount of competition increases and that can slow down their birth rate or increase their death rate. Another way we can add density <coughs> dependence is through the accumulation of waste. And we see this in, for example, uh, density dependent regulation of uh, yeast population size. So the accumulation of these toxic wastes, the waste product for a yeast, for example, would be alcohol. That alcohol is not great if you're a yeast cell trying to grow. Um, and so there can reach a point in a confined area <coughs> where there is too much of that waste around, and then you would see population of this yeast start to decline. Another way we observe density dependence is through predation. So if you remember, we thought about uh, not just one species, but also their relationship with another. Predation is a good example of this, where as a prey population increases, Predators may start to feed preferentially on that species. So an example of this would be a hatch of mayflies, for example, uh, and then a predator like a fish would switch to that prey, and it's dependent on their density. So at first, if there's not many mayflies around or insects around, they're not going to feast on that prey. But once the population reaches a certain size, the predator could switch to that prey and then decrease that population back to lower levels. Do you think it's on availability? Yes. So the question was, is that based on availability? And my answer was, my short answer was yes. Yeah. Okay. A, I forget where we're on, is this the fourth reason? A fourth? A fourth way we can think about density dependence is with <coughs> disease. This would be similar to thinking about the buildup of toxic waste in a constrained area, for example, where population density can influence health and survival of organisms. In dense populations, we expect pathogens to be able to spread more rapidly, and uh, that can, can lead to uh, increase in death rate uh, based on this population, sorry, densely populated area with increased disease prevalence. Okay, so we definitely see density dependence in nature. It's not just in lab beakers with these uh, you know, single-celled organisms or Daphnia. We can see it uh, if we look at uh, this growth of sheep populations on the island of Tasmania. These populations showed a clear S-shaped curve uh, over this 100 year time span. So you can see initially there was uh, geometric growth and then it started to level off at about 2 million sheep, suggesting that the carrying capacity was close to 2 million sheep on this island. Okay. Any questions about those density dependent factors and the way that they contribute to our model of logistic growth. Okay. So I want to emphasize that you know each of these can happen um, in different combinations. They're likely happening all the time. Kind of integrating them together gives us an idea of what a population carrying capacity can be. Although it's difficult, it can be difficult to really constrain exactly what the mechanisms are um, at any given time. So for example here, why is the carrying capacity too many in sheep? You know, it could be food availability in space, it could be diseases, maybe it's toxic waste. 
that one seems less likely to me. But we can hypothesize and test exactly, you know, what is going to be uh, setting the top limit of this population size. And we can test that by looking at different aspects of this. For example, could we um, increase the amount of food that's available to them? Could we, uh, you know, increase their space somehow? I don't know, that may be hard to do on an island, but basically we can experiment and test this in different ways and try to figure out exactly what's driving that carrying capacity. So um, another way to think about this and the differences in density dependent versus density independent growth is that the death rate of a population is not only going to be affected by these density dependent factors like resource use or disease or toxic uh, waste buildup, they can also be affected by density independent factors. So when we're talking about logistic growth, that's always density dependent. But we could also be dealing with things like more uh, sporadic events that would be considered density independent. And there's this example here, which is called inverse density dependent factors. I'm not going to talk very much about them beyond right now because they're rarely observed in nature. The one example um, that I'm aware of is related to territoriality and that behavior in uh, some mammal species where you can have um, greater mortality rates at low population densities because of that territoriality behavior. That's, that's uh, all we're going to talk about with that one. The main two I want you to focus on are density independent factors and density dependent factors. So let's take a look at these density independent factors. Uh, you may have already thought of a few examples of these, but just to reiterate, this is the relative abundance of three different mammal species that were collected over many years. And their abundance doesn't seem to follow an S-shaped curve or a J-shaped curve. And this is partially because there is um, uh, fair amount of seasonal patterns here that happen on an interannual basis that are driving these types of uh, abundance trajectories. So instead of seeing this S-shaped curve or J-shaped curve, it's much more sporadic and uh, you know stochastic would be the word to describe this in terms of when we see high abundance versus when we see low abundance. And part of this is related to, in this case, uh, drought. So the relative abundance of this um, short-tailed shrew in Kanza Prairie in Kansas, which is just about three hours south of here, uh, is totally related to the amount of rainfall uh, in a given year. So with higher soil moisture, with more rainfall, rainfall you would predict to see greater abundance of this shrew, suggesting that it's limited by this density independent factor, which is driven by the climate and not the number of shrews in a population. Of course, there's lots of other examples of this. Wildfire would be a great example. You know, volcanic eruption would be another one. Um, other kind of catastrophic uh, disturbances, floods, for example. All of those can control population size and they have zero dependence on population size itself. They're happening outside of the population, but still having an effect on its abundance or size. Okay. So just to review, populations undergoing geometric or exponential growth have blank limits to growth. I'll give you a choice of many or none or no. Yes. There's none. Right. No limits to growth for exponential growth. Just gonna keep on increasing. Populations undergoing logistic growth will increase in number until blank. I think I heard it. Until they reach what? 
capacity. Carrying capacity, thank you. And then interactions between species, or at least individuals, play a large role in density dependent population growth. Is that true or false? <coughs> Yeah, I think it's true. Predation. Yep, so predation was the example that we talked about here. Um, so that interaction in terms of the numbers uh, does play a role. If you have a larger population size, that can affect things like predation rates. Okay. Everyone feeling pretty good with those, those questions? Got them in your back pocket? Is there any piece that I can go back over in terms of logistic growth? exponential growth, the models that we use to describe those relationships. Okay. So let's, um, let's do some application here. How do we apply what we've learned to populations in nature? Uh, and in fact, going back to why we even want to study population ecology in the first place, one of the main reasons that we, we talked about that is with species conservation, right? So if we want to apply these models to species conservation, how do we actually do that? So uh, this first example I'll tell you about is known as population viability analysis, or PVA. And what population viability takes into account is a basically a probability or a likelihood that a population will or won't go extinct. So in essence, what we're able to do with the population viability analysis is to get a good estimate of what is the minimum population size that we need in order to preserve a given species. It takes into account chance events like fires and droughts. These would be density independent, independent factors. Good. And then also accounts for inbreeding or genetic diversity leading to an extinction vortex. So an extinction vortex would be density dependent, dependent right? Okay. <coughs> Just want to make that clear. We didn't really talk about that as an example, but uh, if you're thinking about genetic diversity as a driver of population size and the extinction vortex, that's a great example of density, the importance of density dependence. So let's take uh, a look at the Florida panther and the population viability analysis that was done in the late 80s as an example of this. And what they did was they looked at uh, a host of data with uh, trialing out the different population sizes to start with. So we have 500 down to 20. And then they looked at what is shown on the y-axis here as percent initial heterozygosity or a measure of genetic diversity in these different populations. What you can see is these are the ones up here that correspond to an initial population size of 500. And then if we look at the other side of the spectrum, at the smallest initial population size of 20, which is shown with these sixes uh, on this line here, we can see that the genetic diversity is relatively stable at 100% or close to 90% through over 100 generations with a population size of 500. But if our initial population size is only 20, then that genetic diversity declines from 100% down to 0% by 100 generations. Okay, So that's part of what they're taking into account with this, this population viability analysis. They can then use that in part of their model to look at the probability of the survival of the Florida panther. And with this information, they basically said, okay, if we have a population size of 20, there's very low probability of survival for this species. If we bump it up to 50, then our population uh, has a greater probability of surviving in the 20 to 30 range. And then if we're in a population size of between 80 and 100, probability of survival gets pretty good. It's way above 0.8. And that suggests that there's a good chance this population would survive. Okay. So this is an example of 
thinking about density dependent factors, density independent factors, crunching them together to figure out what's the likelihood that a population is going to survive for these different population sizes. This would help us set targets for actually protecting the species, right? We know, based on this analysis, that if we get below 60 in terms of the population size, then that population is in trouble. If we can keep it above that, then we're probably in good shape. Another example of uh, using these models to uh, benefit not only the population, but us, is to look at some mechanisms related to the orange ruffy fishery and other fisheries in general, and thinking about their population growth relative to the amount that we catch. Okay, so if you remember we talked about uh, the importance of considering a sustainable catch relative to the population growth of a population of fishes. This is an example where um, for the orange ruffy, it was an, an untapped resource for humans and then uh, we started fishing for it quite heavily and then because of its life history, it doesn't reproduce until it's about 20 to 40 years of age. So it's a very long lived fish. It lives very deep in the ocean. It also produces less than 90,000 eggs per breeding period. That may seem like a lot, but for a fish, that's not that many. And so this, understanding its life history, so when it reproduces, when does it have uh, the greatest age-specific fertility? How fertile is it when it actually does reproduce? That understanding of its population uh, was not considered and so we saw a similar trajectory as we saw for uh, the Atlantic cod with this orange ruffy production, where there was a rapid increase in the late 1970s through uh, the early 1990s, and then the catch started to decrease quite rapidly because the population couldn't keep up with our harvest. Uh, what population biologists will do in this case is to conduct what's called a maximum sustainable yield. And that maximum sustainable yield or harvest is completely based on understanding its population growth uh, and plugging in those models, right? So if we understand its instantaneous growth rate or is it growing geometrically, can it grow geometrically? What does that mean in terms of the population that we can call each year or eat? If we know that information, then we can make good decisions about conserving the species to make sure that A, it survives as a species, and B, we can continue eating it. Okay, so an example of population ecology in action, once again, looking at uh, fish. All right, I think that's all I've got for you today. Are there any questions about those two examples? Before you go, a um, quick reminder, I sent out an email about this, hopefully you all received it, but for next week's lab, getting ready for next week's lab, uh, we are going to be doing a computer simulation looking at populations of wolves and moose on Isle Royale. It's more fun than it sounds, I'm not doing a great job describing it. Uh, it's actually pretty cool, I think. But in order to use it, you will need to uh, access this Simutex software. And it would be helpful if you brought a laptop with you. We're planning to meet in our computer lab, but there are not enough machines to go around for everyone in the lab. So we need at least five people to bring a laptop um, just to work on their own machine. If you're wondering, how do I access Simutex? I sent this in the email, but it's also linked uh, in the assignment on the lab page. Uh, so make sure you check this out over the weekend and you register for the Simutech software. All right. Thanks, y'all. Have a good weekend. Good solution. <laughs> <laughs>